Luke chapter 14 as we study a lesson titled, Is It Lawful? You know, the question of lawfulness was important to both our Lord and Savior and great men of God. In fact, disputes between Jesus and the Jewish leaders often centered on what was or was not lawful. In Luke chapter 14, verse 1, it says, Now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. <clears throat> and behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent, and he took him and healed him and let him go. Then he answered them, saying, Which of you, having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit, will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. So in this account, we have Jesus challenging the Pharisees on what is or is not lawful, particularly is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Is that right or wrong? Then through his action and then through his reasoning, he proves that it is right. That it is something that was lawful. If you go back to Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, here's another occasion. This time it's the Sabbath and Jesus heals a man, but it's the Jews who are challenging him. In Matthew chapter 12, Beginning in verse 9, it says, Now when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? That they might accuse him. And then, of course, Jesus lays out the same argument as he did over in Luke chapter 14. In Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, and beginning in verse 15, there is the question about paying taxes to Caesar. It says, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk, and they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Of course, the Jewish leaders had a particular view on all these issues which was opposed to the view that Jesus had in these issues. And so there's a point of dispute, a point of argument there. If you go back to Matthew chapter 14, Matthew chapter 14, the remember it's telling us about John, how that when Herod he hears about Jesus, he thinks it's John that has been resurrected from the dead. And in verse 3, Matthew 14, verse 3, Herod, it says, had laid hold of John, put him in prison for, his, for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because, verse 4, John had said to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. So John had condemned Herod. You're in sin for doing this. You're in sin for taking your brother's wife. In the other accounts, we see that Jesus made an argument that it was lawful, it was right to pay taxes to Caesar. It was lawful to heal on the Sabbath. And here's something that is unlawful that Herod was engaged in. Now a thing being lawful or not, we see then as vital to our souls because we need to know, we need to know what we must do we need to know what we may do what is permitted and then we need to also know what we must not do what is forbidden we need to understand those things if we're going to be pleasing to God it was a dispute among religious people in the first century and it's something that we need to settle today so how do we determine between what is lawful and unlawful that's the question we really want to get to in a series of studies. We really began last week, but this week beginning to have a greater focus on the idea of authority. 
what is and what is not authorized by the Word of God? How is it that we determine what we can do, what we must do, and what we are forbidden to do? How do we figure all of that out? We want to work through this study together and look to the Word of God for the answers that we need. And today in particular, let's go to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, because we want to study this account here about the time when Jesus' authority was challenged and how that He responded to that and lays out for us the source of authority and where our source of authority really needs to be. In Matthew 21, beginning in verse 23 then, let's read down through 27. Now when He came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted Him as He was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? But Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. See, the Jewish leaders come to Jesus on this occasion. They challenge Him on His authority because they're upset about what He's been teaching and about what He's been doing. When Jesus entered into Jerusalem on, in what we call the triumphal entry at the beginning of chapter 21, and the people were crying out to Him, Hosanna, you know, and they were praising the One who came in the name of the Lord, Luke's account tells us that the Jews told Jesus, tell them to be quiet. You need to rebuke them. They, they shouldn't be saying things like this. And Jesus said, if they're silent, the stones will cry out because they were praising Him as the Messiah. So they didn't like Him teaching that He was the Messiah. And then, of course, He goes into the temple in Matthew 21, verses 12 down through 17, and He cleanses the temple for the second time. And they did not like that at all. And so they're angry, they're upset about this. And they come to Him in verse 23 and challenge Him on that authority because they do not believe what He has done is lawful. So they ask those questions in 23. By what authority are you doing these things? So tell us what Scripture you use that would allow you, a peasant preacher from Galilee, to come in here and do this. Where do you get that authority to do it? Where is it in the tradition of the elders that you have the right to come in here? Because the Jews would see the tradition of the elders as authority because they had practiced many other things. That was another point of dispute between them and Jesus about using the traditions of men. And so they want to know by what authority? Is, it, is there some scripture? Is there some tradition of the elders? Or do you claim to have some type of prophetic office that you're allowed to come in here and do these things? Because we don't think you have the right to do these things. We believe what you've done is unlawful. And who gave you this authority? So wherever you're going to point to the authority you have, who is it that said you could do this? You know, is it a message you received from God? Is it just self-appointed authority? Did you just decide to do it yourself? Was it the council? They knew it wasn't the council. Was there a priest? Because the priest viewed the temple as theirs. It's our domain. We're the ones who run the show here. We can do what we want to do and tell people that they can come in here and buy and sell and change and have the doves and all of that. We're the ones who have the authority here, not you. So what authority do you have and who gave you that authority to come in here and do these things? Of course, as we read there, we know Jesus didn't directly answer that question. But what He does is He tests their integrity. And so He turns it around and He says, okay, I'll ask you a question. If you give an answer to that, then I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. Baptism of John. 
Where was it from? Heaven or men? And he's getting at that idea, where was John authorized to do the things that he did? The Jews begin that reasoning then. If we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? Now what they have understood, what they've connected right now in their mind is, if we say John was sent from heaven and was preaching the message of God, we remember John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we say his message from heaven, he's going to say, Well, why didn't you believe him? Why didn't you accept his teaching? That's the dilemma there. They recognize we, we cannot say from heaven because we're standing here opposed to you saying you don't have the right to be here. We do not believe in you. You're a fraud. You're an imposter. And we want to do away with you. In fact, they wanted to kill him as Mark's account says about him going in and cleansing the temple. They decided we're going to destroy him. So they can't answer from heaven. And then they think about, well, if we say from men, we have a problem with the people. Because the people believed in John, the people revered John, the people saw John as a prophet, and if we say he just had the authority of men, basically John just went out and did what John wanted to do, the people are going to be angry, they're going to riot, they're going to attack us, we're going to lose our power, our influence. So we don't want to face that kind of revolt, so they answer, we don't know. They cop out. Well, Jesus then says, I am not going to answer you either. I will not tell you by what authority I do these things. In other words, we understand this to be you're not worthy of a discussion. You're dishonest, and I'm not going to have a discussion with dishonest people. And that's just a side lesson for us. If we know somebody's dishonest, there's no point in getting into a discussion with them. That's a no-win situation. So, Jesus will not answer. Now, let's understand Jesus not answering their question, what authority, who gave you this authority, is Him dodging the issue of authority or thinking the issue of authority is unimportant. It doesn't matter. That is not what the Lord is doing. He believed there are things that are lawful and other things that are not. We reference back to the Luke chapter 14 because He directly asked them, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? So the Lord was one who was focused on that, who saw the legitimacy of that question, that issue. Lawful, authorized, unlawful, unauthorized. He was all about dealing with that on very specific issues. So he's not dodging the issue of his actions being lawful or not here. He agreed that there was a need of authority as seen in his question to the Jews. When you back up to verse 25 again, you know, John's baptism, was it from heaven or from men? So he saw there's authority that's needed and I want you to answer this question of authority. Are you honest? Will you, and will the answer that they give make any difference? Or the answer that He gives to them, will that make any difference? You know, Jesus said, God has authorized me and here's the Scripture about it and here's why I can come in here and do it and here's where you violated Scripture. Do you think the Jews would have listened to Him? It wouldn't have made any difference. They had their minds and their hearts made up that He was a fraud. They didn't want Him around. They wanted to get rid of of him. But one of the things we learn in this, of course, is authority is either from heaven or it's from men. And the authority of heaven is found in the Word of God. If you go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. All authority is given by inspiration, or all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All Scripture is God-breathed. It comes from the mind and the mouth of God, if you will. 
And it is profitable. It's good. It's beneficial, he says, for doctrine, for reproof, correction, righteousness, to keep us on the straight and narrow, to help us to understand what it is we need to believe and what we need to do in order to be pleasing to God. He says it is so complete, if you will, that it makes us complete, that the man of God may be complete, that we may be all that we are to be in relationship to God and to do His will in this life. Thoroughly equips us for every good work. You go back to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. And here the Apostle Paul is on trial. In Acts 26, he goes before Felix and Agrippa, or rather Festus and Agrippa on this occasion. Festus doesn't know what to do with Paul. Agrippa is there and he has a better knowledge and understanding about the way. And as Paul is giving his defense and explaining, I was on the road to Damascus and the Lord appeared to me and this is what He said to me and this is then what I did. As he's going through all of that, it says this in Acts 26 verse 24. As he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. And that makes sense when we understand that the Word of God is God-breathed or the Bible is God-breathed. It comes from the mouth of God. Then therefore those words are words of truth and reason. In other words, when you look into the Word of God, it's not a fantasy. It's not a philosophy of men. It's not something that is irrational. It is something that is truth and reason. The Gospel is truth and everything in the Word of God is truth. It's grounded in fact. And it's grounded in history. Things that actually happened and unfolded. So, as Paul is talking about it, he says, I was on the road to Damascus. I was journeying from Jerusalem to Damascus. There was a bright light that shone. He's giving historical fact of what unfolded. He's explaining, here's what Jesus said to me. And I saw Him. He was resurrected from the dead. He says, I speak the words of reason. It's rational. It's logical. You know, people attack the Word of God and say that it's unworthy, it's unreliable. But when you study it with an open and honest heart, you understand it's truthful, it's reasonable, it's rational, it's logical. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 17 then. Matthew chapter 17, just to put a fine point on it here. Understanding about this message from heaven, this authority from heaven. We find it in the Word of God and very specifically we find it in the New Covenant. In Matthew 17 beginning in verse 1 it says, Now after six days Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves and he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now there are a lot of various things that we could learn out of this account, but to the point we're making here is you have Moses, Elijah, and Jesus all there. And Peter wants to honor all three of them, and he wants to honor all three of them in the same way, equally. And when He says that, then God the Father overshadows them, overwhelms them here, and says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear Him. You're not to listen and to follow Moses in the law, 
You're not to listen to and follow Elijah, the prophets. You're to listen to Jesus, the Son of God. He has the message of me. As Hebrews chapter 1 talks about, God in various times, in various ways, in times past, spoke to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us through His Son. This is the same message here in Matthew chapter 17. We are to listen to Jesus. His will is expressed in the New Testament. That is the authority of heaven. And if we go to Revelation chapter 22, Revelation chapter 22, let's recall the principle that's laid out here. It applies specifically to the book of Revelation, but the principle applies to the entirety of the Word of God. In Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, it says, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. We are not to add to or take from the word of God. It has been revealed in its fullness and its completeness. And no man or group of men can improve upon that. The only thing that happens when we add to or take from the Word of God is we begin to undermine it. We begin to corrupt it. We destroy it. And so we are not to add to it or take away from it. In Galatians chapter 4, Galatians 4, where we've been studying on our Sunday morning class, Verses 10 and 11, Paul says, You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. In other words, they had added in these feast days, these celebrations, these holy days that God had not put into the new covenant. And Paul is saying, I'm afraid because you're doing this and now you're negating the salvation you once enjoyed. I'm concerned that I've labored in vain and you're just going to be lost. Then again, in 2 John. 2 John. Remember 2 John, verse 7. John says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So the Galatians were adding things to it. And he says, you're condemned for that. I've labored in vain. And now here are some people taking away something. They're taking away the incarnation of the Son of God that Jesus actually didn't come in the flesh. And here it is being condemned. They are anti-Christ. They're against the Lord. So when we add to the Word of God or we take away from the Word of God, we enter into sin, we destroy it. So we can't add to or take from it. The authority of God is in the Word of God in its fullness, in its entirety. There's nothing missing and there's nothing redundant or oh, uh, beyond what we need here. It is absolutely what we need in all of its fullness. Now you remember John, or rather Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23. Oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself, it is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. See, authority in men or from men is unlawful. Proverbs 14, 12 says that there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So the lawful authority is from heaven. The unlawful authority is from men. If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul is dealing with people at Corinth who are undermining him and his authority as the apostle of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12, he says, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. In other words, they're foolish. 
Now, Paul is making an argument all through here about that he is the apostle of Jesus Christ. He has the authority of an apostle. But in this verse, he turns it around and says, we're not like them. It's my authority doesn't come from me comparing myself to other people. But they measure themselves by themselves. In other words, they are their own authority. They're looking at each other and saying, I approve of you, you approve of me, and, and you're right and I'm right and you think I'm right. That's how they were judging things. That's what they were basing their authority on, their actions on. And Paul's saying that's foolish. It's not wise. It's not good. So when you think about ecclesiastical authority or authority that rests in men and religious leaders, that doesn't work. That is not according to the will of God. It is not the authority of heaven. A convention of churches. If you got a whole lot of churches together and they decided something's right or something's wrong, it doesn't make it right or wrong. If you were to have a congregational vote on something being right or wrong, it doesn't mean anything. Because that's where we're comparing ourselves among ourselves. We're not wise in things like that. So the authority for men, whether it's self, personally, individually, ecclesiastical, we get together as a group and we say, hey, here are the things we want. Or if it's something that's written down like a creed, as men have tried in times past, remember in 2 John, well, let's go to Colossians 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 18 beginning. Colossians 2, verse 18 beginning. He says, Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which are not what he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you die with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. So he says, here's these doctrines and commandments of men, these things that are being taught to you in these days. Men write these things down. They put them in their books, whether it's the Book of Mormon, the Methodist Book of Discipline, or whatever it might be. They put these things down and they say, here's your religious standard. And that's what they were teaching here to those at Colossae. Well, don't touch, don't taste, don't handle. You know, observe these days, don't observe these others. Eat this food, don't eat the pork. All those things that they were bringing in to the New Covenant. And he says, all of that is a self-imposed religion, verse 23. They're doing it by their authority, not God's authority. And they are no value whatsoever against indulgence of the flesh. Those man-made regulations do not make you holy. They do not make you pure and righteous. They do not keep you out of sin. The only thing that's going to do that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now let's go to Matthew 16. Matthew chapter 16. Let's look at a couple of examples of authority from heaven versus authority from men. So Matthew 16, verse 15. Let's back up to verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who do men say that I am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So men were saying, He is a great prophet. That's who Jesus is. He's a great prophet. He's, he's a great man, has great teachings. He's very powerful in his speaking and, and has great influence. 
That's what men were saying. But notice what Jesus says in verse 15. But who do you say that I am? That's what men are saying, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, verse 16, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Men haven't revealed this to you. It's not because of men. It's not the authority of men. It's not men who have come up with this idea that I am the Son of God. But my Father in heaven has revealed it to you. I have the authority of heaven. I have the blessing of the Father in heaven. That's the authority of heaven versus the authority of men. Heaven says He's the Son of God. Men say He's a good man. There's a difference. A vast difference there. What about in the matter of salvation? If we go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. In verse 37, when it records that the audience was cut to the heart, they asked Peter, the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They recognized that they were in sin, that they were lost, they were condemned before God. And in verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the message from heaven to men who are in sin is, as Peter just preached, you need to believe that Jesus is Lord in Christ, verse 36. When men come to that conviction and understanding and then are ready to do something about it, He says, repent and be baptized and your sins will be washed away. Men say, oh, you believe Jesus is the Christ, you're saved. See, there's authority from heaven it says not only believe, but repent and be baptized. Authority of men say, faith only. Authority is going to come from either heaven or from men. And so we will either do what is lawful or we will do what is unlawful. You will open up to number 822. 822. As we think about this, you know, we ought to care enough about pleasing God and saving our own souls to want to know what is and what is not authorized by Him. We ought to want to know whether or not something is lawful and that is going to be determined by God. Scripture is the basis for knowing the will of God and what is authorized by Him. So let us submit to the authority of heaven and reject the doctrines and commandments of men. We need to search out the Scripture and rightly apply it. And that's what we want to do in the studies in the future, Lord willing. It's how is it that we determine what is applicable to us? Of what we must do, what we may do, and what we are forbidden to do. But this morning, ask yourself this question. Are your beliefs and your behaviors based on authority from heaven or is it based on your personal authority? Are you doing what you want to do or are you doing what God directs you to do? If you're doing God's will, you're righteous, you're upright, you're in fellowship with Him, you have the hope of everlasting life. If you're doing your own will, you're condemned, you're in sin, you're lost, and you're doomed when the judgment comes. Jesus came to spare you that doom, to redeem you from your sins, that they may be washed away. Do you believe in Him? Are you ready to repent of your sins and be baptized to have your sins washed away? If you're ready for that, you want to submit to the authority of heaven to do what is lost in the eyes of God. We encourage you to do that today. And if you're a child of God who strayed from the truth of God, strayed from the authority of heaven, and you recognize that you need to make corrections, you again need to submit 
to the Father in heaven, then won't you do that this morning? Turn to Him, repent, confess your sin, and He will forgive you. If you need to respond, we invite you to come forward while we stand and sing.